and it's the area of optimization. So I started trying to convey to you the, the concepts of what is the likelihood, uh, what are priors, what is Bayesian learning, what's frequentist learning. And for that, we use the linear model, mainly because the linear model is very tractable. You can do everything analytically. With the Gaussian process, too, you do, we did everything analytically. With random forest, we kind of obviated the math, but we still had a sort of heuristic model. And we did it in an incremental way, so in an algorithmic perspective. It's possible to take that into an objective function, but sometimes the algorithmic that you optimize, but sometimes the algorithmic perspective is just very clean, very natural to explain. Um, we're now going to turn up to the problem of optimization. So in machine learning, often, when we're dealing with complex models like neural networks or many other models, in fact, we tend to formulate an objective function that we want to optimize. So there's some, an objective function also receives the name of an energy function or an error function. It, it's something that you need to minimize. Um, if you take e to the minus the cost, you basically get a probability. So maximizing a probability, same as minimizing a cost function because of this mapping uh, between the two. So th this in machine learning is called empirical risk minimization. Um, empirical because we're using the data. And risk is another word for loss or loss or cost or energy. Um, so there's a lot of jargon, but it all means the same thing. Um, so we're trying to minimize this cost function. And that's uh, like for a Gaussian I already made a case that if you minimize a quadratic, you're maximizing a Gaussian. So, uh, in particular, finding the parameters that maximize the Gaussian, finding the mean of the Gaussian. Um, now, a lot of these problems will not be analytical anymore, like they were before. And so we're going to rely on optimization techniques to find the minimum. And an optimization technique, in short, think of an, a cost function as the mountains in Whistler. And minimizing a cost function means if you want to find the minimum, that is, you're essentially looking for the place of the lowest altitude. So the process of learning is start on top of Whistler and go downhill. Going downhill is finding a stable um, configuration uh, is, uh, that will be used for some predictive task. And the way that I'm going to suggest you go downhill is by looking at the steepest in other words, avoid the green slopes. Just go for the double black diamond and follow those, because that's the quickest way to get down. OK, so today we're going to talk about um, when you do optimization using the derivative of the function, there's essentially two approaches. Um, first order methods, they use the first derivative. And then second order methods, as the name implies, they use the second derivative. Um, First derivatives and second derivatives, when we have vectors, are called uh, gradients and Hessians. Okay, so these are just two new fancy words to describe all concepts of calculus. Um, so we're going to describe then the method for estimating the solution when all we have is the gradient. And then I'm going to discuss a method for estimating the solution when we have both the gradient and the Hessian, which are the second derivatives. That method is known as Newton's algorithm as well. And then we're going to deal with an important problem in optimization, which is you might be applying a neural network to Twitter data, for example. But now the Twitter data keeps increasing, right? Because if you're monitoring tweets, they keep coming at you every day. So the data set doesn't stop arriving. So we call these streaming applications, because the data is streaming in. Same as us. We learn to see throughout life, and we keep getting data coming into our senses. It's not like we've collected the data, done some analysis, cross-validation. Uh, the data is coming in continuously uh, uh, and being captured by our senses. Um, and so for these applications, the idea of let's store the data first, do the computation, doesn't make sense anymore. 
as the data arrives, we need to update our parameters online, recursively in time. And by recursive here, I mean online, as opposed to recursion in the standard computer science uh, sense. There's a recursion in time. All right. And to illustrate these techniques, all of these techniques, I'm only going to use the linear model, because that's a model that we all understand well by now. So we're going to use the linear model, and we're going to apply, even though the linear model has a direct way of computing the solution, the idea is I'm going to show you that these optimization techniques could also find the same answer that our analytical computations in the linear model. In fact, they'll be equivalent, for, uh, as, as we'll show. Um, and, then, and then in the next class, we, I'm going to introduce uh, the, f the first step toward building neural networks, which is logistic regression, which is essentially a network with one neuron. And we're going to apply all these techniques to logistic regression. Now, logistic regression is extremely popular in industry. Companies like um, Twitter, companies like Google, they use that technique extensively. It's sort of one of the workhorses <coughs> for binary classification out there. Um, but you'll see that using our ideas of optimization, it's going to be very easy to apply logistic regression in practice. OK. So, Let's assume we want to optimize a function. And let's assume that this function, so that I can plot it, has two parameters. So the function is this quadrat is this function here, f. And f has two parameters, theta naught and theta one. So for example, when we do linear regression, we, the cost function that we, so we, we minimize this cost function. And then I've argued before many times that if you want to minimize, if, if, you, if this is f, minus f is just you know, the same function flipped up. Okay, so if we have a ball and we want to minimize it, that's the same as maximizing minus the ball. So, so we want to maximize this function, the negative error. And we have two parameters, theta naught and theta one. The function is plotted here in purple, in 2D, or magenta. And um, at any point, um, oh, I should say, uh, if I were to cut this function, so I slice it horizontally, then I would get these lines here in black, and these are contour lines. And of course, a contour line just means same height. Okay, so we used to maps. We see these uh, in maps on the web all the time. So if you want to go skiing and you want to know the height of the different peaks, um, most ski resorts will give you a map of contours that indicate the height of where you are. So, so those are the lines. Now there is a theorem that I hope most of you saw in calculus two, because that's what it's proven. Um, and that theorem says, and if you didn't see it before, I strongly recommend you just type gradient vector space Wikipedia and go to Wikipedia and the explanation is there. That theorem tells you that the gradient and the gradient definition is this. is the derivative of the function of several parameters with respect to each parameter. Okay, so for this particular function here, the gradient of f of theta naught and theta one, and keep in mind that I'm using the bold symbol to the naught vector, which I can't do bold with a with a pen, so I underscore it. And that bold vector has two components that are scalar, theta naught and theta one. So this is, an, uh, this is a vector in R2. Okay, so we're doing a linear regression where theta naught is the intercept and theta one is the slope. Okay, just like before, imagine the machine learning task is you have some y's, you have some x's, and you're fitting a line, 
and then the slope is theta one, the intercept is theta naught. So this is the sort of typical exercise that we've done um, kind of ad nauseum now in the course. The gradient then is just equal to, in this case there are two parameters, so the gradient is a 2D vector and it would be the derivative of f with respect to theta naught and the derivative of f with respect to theta one. Okay, so that would be the gradient for this particular function. So the gradient would have two, two components. That is, the gradient is a vector in 2D. Okay. Now the gradient will be a function of theta as well. Okay, because the function is a function of theta. If you, if you differentiate, there will be some theta still left. And so the gradient will change depending on the values of theta naught and theta one. These arrows <coughs> that I'm plotting here, the blue arrow, that's the gradient. Now that theorem says that the gradient, which is 2D in this case, is always perpendicular to the contour plots. Okay, that's a classical result of calculus. I won't prove it, but I recommend you go to Wikipedia and look at the proof. Or how many of you saw this in calculus, proving that the gradient is so about half of you. For the other half, talk to the ones that left at the hand now, or probably you saw it and forgot it because it was a long time ago, but that's sort of a classical calculus exercise. Now, if you haven't seen it, go to Wikipedia. Um, now, uh, from this course perspective, what's essential is that you know the conclusion of that theorem, that theta naught, that the gradient is perpendicular to the contour plots. And what that means is if you go perpendicular to the contour plots, you essentially are going in the direction of greatest ascent because you're going, so the contour plots tells you the direction of equal height. If you go perpendicularly, you essentially are going in the direction where the height changes the most. The height, so in other words, again, if you're skiing or snowboarding and you follow the gradient, you're basically picking the double black diamond slopes. You're trying to go down as fast as you can. So taking the most risk. If you have, if the function f, as we'll see later when you use a neural network, this function could have many parameters. Uh, the typical networks that people use these days involve like 100,000 parameters. Uh, sorry, 100 million parameters. And so the, the, the size of the gr gradient will be a vector of 100 million components that we try to estimate online. If you do not have a quadratic function, but you're trying to minimize a function that's more like what you get for a neural network, then the idea is you, you start at some point, and what you do is you take a guess at what you think theta might be. And then after taking the guess, you follow the gradient to the bottom. Now, if you started in a different place and you follow the gradient, you would end up at a different solution. With a quadratic, our solution is always here. Okay, because a quadratic, no matter where you start, if you're going uphill, you'll get there. Um, you'll get to the same point. With the function that's non-quadratic, then it does matter where you start. If you start in Blackcomb, or as opposed to starting in Whistler, which are two different mountains, uh, an hour and a half from this classroom, you will end up at two different local minima. One will hit a lake, one might hit the village of Whistler. Actually, one will hit another village, and I've been part of that experiment, because once I hit this other village, and I'm like, what am I? <laughs> and I had to catch the bus and so on. I don't know how many of you have gone through that experience. It's painful, um, especially if it's the last run of the day. Um, see, these guys have experienced it too. <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, if, you want to get, if you want to avoid getting stuck in a small local minima, can you add a velocity term to that so that when you're doing your gradient descent, each time you iterate it adds to some velocity and then you can overshoot any local minima? Yes, indeed. You're doing physics again. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's a physicist. So physicists immediately think in terms of um, dynamics, uh, speed, not just position, but speed and so on. And indeed, uh, optimization people do that. And this speed term, uh, something very analogous to that. Well, speed momentum. And so momentum is just mv, so mass times uh, velocity. And so people do add a term um, to do that. So neural networks, um, it's called the, the terminology is momentum, and it's used a lot actually to, to get quicker convergence. And today I'm going to talk about two tricks to improve the convergence of this. So, but we'll start first with the notion of gradients, and then we will introduce uh, more and more complex algorithms. And of course, our solutions might be different, but the whole, many problems tend to have many solutions, but each of these solutions is reasonable. And the way we know that it's reasonable is again we conduct some cross-validation or bootstrapping to know that, to, to estimate how good uh, our model is. So to assess the quality of the model. Um, but yeah, we're no longer in the world where we can find a unique solution. Solving a neural network, in fact, finding the parameters is an NP-hard problem. So this optimization is, it's hopeless to expect that you'll find a global optimum because that would take, uh, you know, longer time than the sun will exist in our universe. Uh, that's essentially what exponential time means. Um, but um, like I've argued many times before, a lot of the problems that we encounter in nature are not of this worst case uh, scenario. By the way, uh, I think the major prize for science was just awarded to professor in Toronto, Stephen Cook, who works on uh, NP hardness of science and so on. Um, it means that computer science keeps getting lots of awards for top research done in Canada these days. It's a good thing. Uh, good thing for us, for those of you here doing computer science. Actually, for all of us, because we're all doing computer science right now. Um, but in um, going back to um, the world is not adversarial as the theory of, of NP hardness um, sees it. Um, if you have images, and the, the size of images that we sense is of uh, a, mid, a thousand by a thousand pixels. So roughly a billion pixels is what goes through our optic nerve uh, to a vision. Um, and so if you consider all the images with 256 possible colors, um, the space of images then would be two f the total possible set of images for which we'd have to learn uh, would be 256 um, to the power 1 billion, 1 million. And 256 to 1 million is a huge number, like our brain would never be able to deal with such a huge number, uh, which is probably more than the number of atoms in the universe too, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, physicists, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so, um, but we are able to see and not only are we able to see, spiders are able to see, as I've argued to you before. And, you know, all the creatures that, that move, that, that have a brain to move around, are cap most creatures are capable of seeing. Um, and um, so, how can it be if the computation is so hard that we can see? And the reason is because the set of images we encounter in the world is much smaller than that space of. 256 to the, to the power million. Okay, the type of images you see in your life, they tend to be the same. And if you move away from here and you go and live in Singapore, you'll see the same kind of images. Trees still look like trees and so on. And things are still smooth, there's edges and so on. So there's, um, the average case is much smaller than the worst case. Okay, so one should not be worried about the fact that it's the, the, the optimum that we find a local optimum. All right, so the other concept that I need to introduce is the concept of uh, second derivatives of a vector. 
of a function of several variables. Because um, here the catch is that this function is a function of more than one variable. It's a function of several variables, so the derivative then becomes this vector of derivatives. Um, if we want to compute the second derivatives, then we need to consider all the possible cases. So that you could be differentiating with respect to theta 1 twice, or theta 1 and then theta 2, or first you differentiate with theta 2 and then differentiate about theta 1. So depending on the order in which you pick the parameters, you'll end up with a um, n by n such derivatives. So, so that matrix then of size n by n is what we call a Hess. So that's the matrix of second derivatives. Uh, when we have 100 million parameters, that's a very large matrix. Okay, it's 100 million squared parameters. Okay, so in machine learning, so the, this, the, the entire field of optimization is dedicated to optimized functions. Um, there's many good courses here at UBC on this. Um, we will be focused here on functions where there is an element of randomness. And that element of randomness for us is the date. So we're going to have a data set. And it's a, for now, we'll assume that it's a batch. And we will use the term batch, which is a term that's used in machine learning, to describe a group of data. It's a batch of data. We have um, n such data. If we were doing regression, the data would consist, each data point consists of an input and an output, an x and a y. But for simplicity of the notation, I'm just using x's here, obviated the pairs. And so the function that we want to optimize, which I, for short I write as f of theta, is really a function of two things. It's a function of theta and it's a function of the date. And in particular, it will be a function of this form. It will be an average over the date. And when we compute derivatives, uh, we take the derivative with respect to theta, which is the gradient. And because of linearity, again, this constant 1 over n comes out. And, and we can take the derivative inside. So if you want to compute the derivative of the cost function when you have data, you just need to compute the derivative with respect to each data point individually. Um, here is an example. So we know that the cost function, um, and you could put here or not a 1 over n. It, it really doesn't matter if you don't have the 1 over n there because that's a constant factor and it disappears. Um, but in typically in, in regression, this is our quadratic cost function. And we can rewrite our quadratic cost function like this. This is just the sum of squared errors. And we minimize it to find the least squares estimate. And as you can see, this is just like this. So it's of that form. So each of these guys here, this is just an f of theta and xi. And in, in this case, in particular, it's xi and yi. Because there's each data point here is a pair, xi, yi. OK? So, and most cost functions, neural networks, and in logistic regression and so on, they will all be of this form. They will all be a sum of terms. There will be a different sum of different terms. The function will be slightly different. There'll be functions that will look like entropy. Uh, cross entropy um, or like zero one error, which I will define later. Um, but the form is still a sum of these error terms. Okay, so how do we get the gradient um, of a function? So let's do our quadratic um, cost function. Um, if that's our function, then the gradient of f, there's two ways you can go about getting it. Um, if you know matrix differentiation, things are a lot quicker. Um, the gradient of f of theta is just equal to the, the derivative with respect to theta of this guy. And so it's uh, d by d theta of y transpose y minus 2. Um, 
2y transpose x theta plus theta transpose x transpose x theta okay and that's just equal to um, minus 2 x transpose y theta plus 2 x transpose x theta okay that's a calculate the same calculation we did before when we did linear models and alternatively you could have taken the derivative of this and if you did you would have ended up with the gradient of f of theta is equal to uh, there's a 2 there there's a minus 2 and then you take the derivative with respect to each term so there's still a sum there and then you would have an xi transpose yi minus xi theta and these are vectors of course <coughs> Uh, do I? Oh yes, I do have an extra theta. Thank you. Okay, and so and then this expression is the same as this expression. Okay, so one is in matrix form, one is in vector, single component. If you want the Hessian, and let's see, what did I use for the Hessian as the symbol squared? If you want the Hessian of f of theta, then that's the derivative with respect to theta of the gradient. And so you get 0, and then you get plus 2 x transpose x. So in other words, 2x transpose x. That's the Hess. Okay. Now, uh, so that's essentially the example, what the, in this case the gradient and the Hessian are. And what I'm going to do next uh, for the rest of the lecture is I'm going to go first describe to you how to follow gradients, and then I will tell you how to use the curvature of the function because that's what the second derivative measures, the curvature of the function. And I will describe the two algorithms that would allow you to optimize uh, theta. And in both algorithms, we'll be coming back to these expressions. So, uh, so we'll use the, these particular uh, forms of the, the Hessian and the gradient. Okay, so the first algorithm is let's just follow the gradient. Let's just pick the direction of the greatest descent and go and follow that direction. So if you have a quadratic and you're here, let me try to use a color with contrast. Um, you just go down to the minimum. Okay, that's, or if you look at the contour plot, you would be doing something like this, where you would be perpendicular to the contour plot and you're going to the minimum. Um, if your function is like this, then you would be maybe following uh, this to get to the minimum, or if you start here, you would maybe end up going this way. And in each case, what you would be doing is you would be going perpendicular to the contours. Okay. And so the gradient, as I mentioned before, the gradient always points in the direction of greatest ascent. So as we saw in this picture, the gradient is pointing, the gradient vectors are pointing toward where the maximum is. So in other words, away from the minimum. So in, in this picture, because we're minimizing, they'll be, po they'll be pointing toward the maximum. So in order to minimize, we just take the old theta. So we start at a particular theta k and we go in the opposite direction of the gradient and we get theta k plus 1. Okay, So the gradient is pointing away from the minimum so we need to go in the opposite direction and that's why we have a minus. If you want to do maximization all you do is you change this minus for a plus. 
So you just change the direction in which you travel. And the gradient, I'm just using the word GK, and sometimes I will write it like this. That's just a question of which, symbol you want, which symbols you want to use. Now, in addition, I'm going to introduce a constant here, a constant term called the step size or the learning rate. Um, this tells me by how much, how much I trust my gradient, how aggressive I want to be. Um, if I want to be, you know, how aggressive, essentially think of it as the trade-off as to whether you want to go s through a smoother uh, trajectory or whether you want to go too fast. Now, if you have a ball, okay, so let's imagine there's a ball here. Now, if I go too fast, if I decide to go too fast down the ball, what's going to happen? Will I get to the minimum? Okay. If I have something like this, let's see if I can do a demo. So I have a ball like this. If I throw a coin, what happened? It didn't stop here at the minimum. It overshoot. So if you have too much, if I try to th throw it slowly, it might oscillate and then comes back to the minimum. If I throw it too quickly, it overshoots. Right? So if something is going down, it might just end up oscillating because it's going too fast. So imagine it's like a super fit snowboard that it's capable of going up. Maybe it's holding, I don't know, some engine or something. And it keeps going up and down. But if you go too slowly, that is if I put like bubble gum on the edges of this coin to, to slow its progress, to make it very sticky, then it might go very slowly and then it gets stuck. Okay, because it's got sort of uh, gum. That makes it sticky, stick to the paper. So eta controls essentially the stickiness of this coin, or the, the momentum. If, 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 if I make it go too fast in the direction of the gradient, it will overshoot. If the, so if eta is too large, it will overshoot. If eta is too small, it will get stuck. So there is an issue of tuning eta. So, actually, let me bring that. So here is that picture. So in this case, um, eta is too small, and so we're following that the new theta is equal to the old theta minus eta times the gradient, and the gradient as evaluated at the previous theta. So in this case, first note that the gradient is always perpendicular to the contour plot. But what's happening here is there's bubble gum, so it gets stuck. It never gets to the minimum. Eta is too small. In this case, eta is too large. And so if eta is too large, then what happens is it starts oscillating. And it doesn't converge to the optimum. And in the rest of the class, we look at several strategies to deal with the choice of heat. OK, so let's first see how we do gradient descent for linear regression. So if we're doing linear regression, um, we know that the, the Hessian, sorry, the, the gradient of f of theta is just equal to minus 2 x transpose y plus 2 x transpose x theta. In other words, then your algorithm will be theta k plus 1 equal to theta k minus eta. And then we write this expression for the gradient. Minus 2 x transpose y plus 2 x transpose x theta k. Okay? And that's the algorithm. So you just have a loop over k, so k is the index of the loop, and you start with a random theta, and then, and then at each step, 
you add to theta this term here. Okay? Or if you want to rewrite it not in matrix notation, then this would be theta k minus eta. And then I'm still going to, oh, so there'll be a minus 2. And there'll be a sum from i equal 1 to n xi transpose uh, yi minus xi theta. And as you can see that the, if you have a good fit to the data, if you have a good fit, then that term is going to be small. And if that term is small, and this is like, okay. Um, if this term here is, um, so this basically is a measure of the fit to the data. If that term, if y is equal to x theta, if you have a good line, then that term will be small. So when that term is small, that means that what I'm adding to this guy is going to be very little. So theta stops changing. <coughs> But if my error is large, then chicha, theta will change a lot. Now let's look at the second order methods, or the Newton methods. So in the Newton method, um, we're going to introduce the matrix of second derivatives. And the, the, what we're going to do, and this is the only difference with the gradient descent, is instead of using eta, we replaced eta by a whole matrix, the inverse of the Hessian. So instead of using eta, because eta is hard to figure out what it is, you would have to try different ethers and see how which one works best. Um, how about we use the curvature of the function to decide how quickly you should go? Sort of makes sense. If you have a very steep function like this, then you probably should go slowly. If your function is very flat, like this, then you want to go faster. You want to choose uh, a faster eta. Okay, a larger eta. So use a small eta, use a large eta. So it seems that the eta that you have should be inverse proportionally to the curvature of this function. And since the Hessian measures curvature, we use the Hessian um, to deal with the curvature. Of course, in this case, I'm showing you the curvature in one dimension, but a function in 2D has curvature in this dimension and curvature in this dimension. So we need to look at the curvature in all dimensions, and that's what the Hessian captures. Okay. Now, to um, Um, to derive this algorithm, uh, we use a uh, Taylor series. Uh, how many of you saw Taylor series in your undergrad degree? That's most of you. Okay. What you might not have seen is the Taylor series for multivariate calculus. Uh, but just like you define a Taylor series as being the function at the new value, the function at the new value, so this is the new value, of theta, this is the old value. The function at the new, new value is the function at the old value, and then the series goes plus the derivative times the difference, the delta theta. So this guy here is the change in theta. Um, the delta theta, and then plus a half, or one over two factorial, which is two a delta theta squared times the second derivative, and so on. So here it's just the same thing, except we use gradients for the first derivatives, and we use Hessians for the second order derivatives. Because um, in this case, theta is a vector, the Hessian is a matrix. Okay. If we multiply a vector times a vector, we get a scalar, and a vector times a matrix times another vector, we again get a scalar. So that ensures that we still have a function that's a scale. Okay, so what we do next, um, in order to find, so essentially what we're doing is we're taking f and we're replacing f by a quadratic approximation of f. 
A Taylor approximation of order two is essentially saying, at theta k, make a quadratic approximation. So the picture, the picture is the following. In red here, this is your f of theta. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a quadratic function approximation, f of f quad of theta. And we make the approximation be accurate around theta k. Okay? So around theta k, the approximation is very good. Um, sorry about that. So around theta k, f of f quad and f of theta, they're both very close to each other. But away from theta k, the approximation can become very bad. Okay, so we're making an approximation that's only good locally. And then we're going to take a step and we're going to uh, repeat the approximation. Okay, but let's first derive the algorithm. Um, so in deriving the algorithm, uh, what we need to do is minimize, let me try to bring another color. We need to minimize the quadratic function. So the idea is we have a function that's very complex to minimize. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to fit a quadratic because that quadratic locally is going to capture the curvature. And then we minimize the quadratic because we know how to minimize a quadratic. So it's easy to minimize a quadratic because you will find the minimum. And so to minimize this <coughs> quadratic, we find the gradient of the quadratic. Okay. So we take the derivative with respect to theta of this function, f quadratic. And then this guy does not depend on theta. So theta k is just the old value, the one that we had already seen. And our free variable he here is the new theta which is just simply theta. So the derivative of the first term is zero um, plus the derivative of the second term which is just gk. Um, plus, and now we need to compute the derivative with respect to theta of this and, whoops, and that's just hk theta minus theta k. I just use my notes here, but you can go and check this at home. Now, in order to find a minimum, we equate this to zero. Okay, and so we have that minus gk at the minimum is equal to hk times theta minus theta k. In other words, the optimal uh, theta will be equal to hk multiplies gk on the other side and then you move theta k to the other side oops multiplying by the inverse that is and so that's the update for the Newton method. That's where it comes from. And so in, in the picture, we're doing a quadratic op approximation. We find the minimum of the quadratic, which is this point here in blue. So that's theta k plus y. And then what we do at the next iteration is we repeat the process. So once again, we find a quadratic here. And we minimize this quadratic. And that gives us theta k plus 2. Okay. And that's how we proceed. This is the apple tree in Trinity College, Cambridge. And Newton was, um, he was in this building. It's either this window or Wait, this is this window. One of those windows, that's where Newton used to live uh, for a while. 
Um, this apple tree, actually, well, obviously, that apple tree is a tail. You know the, the, the Newton story of the apple falling in his head or whatever? Um, but this comes from a town nearby where, it's, where Newton actually lived. Okay, so let's look at Newton's algorithm for linear regression. So we know that the gradient uh, G, which is the gradient of F, um, is just equal to minus 2x transpose y plus 2x transpose x theta. We know that the Hessian H, which is the second derivative, is equal to x transpose x. Okay. Um, so then if we have Newton's method, okay, then we simply have theta k plus one being equal to oops theta k minus and now we're going to write the Hessian which is 2x transpose x inverse okay and x is not invertible because x is n by t but x transpose x um, is invertible because it's a quadratic uh, matrix provided it has full norm, that, that is that it's full rank. And then times the gradient, and in this case the gradient is just minus 2x transpose y plus 2x transpose x, and it's the gradient evaluated at theta k. Okay. Now this is equal to theta k and now we're going to multiply these terms so the twos actually because this two is being inverted that two will cancel with these other two twos and so minus times minus will give us plus x transpose x minus one x transpose y and then we will get minus times plus will give us minus x transpose x inverse times x transpose x theta k okay now theta this cancels with this because a inverse times a uh, is the identity and so this theta will then cancel with this theta because you have theta k minus theta k and we get that the answer then is just equal to this Okay, that shouldn't be surprising. That's the least square solution. And I've argued that if you follow the gradient, pay attention to derivatives, you'll get to the minimum. With, with, so with Newton method, you're guaranteed in one single iteration to get to the minimum. And it makes sense because if you have a quadratic and you approximate a quadratic with a quadratic, you will fit it perfectly. So all you need is one single step to get to the minimum. With the gradient method, you'll get to the minimum, but only if you have the right value of eta. Okay, um, here is uh, one practical concern when we implement the Newton CG method. Um, typically, we write this as theta k plus one equal theta k plus dk where dk is defined as, you know, what it should be, minus h inverse times g, as the Hessian. Um, but the advantage of doing it this way is that it's, what we do is we solve first a linear system, okay, because this guy here, dk equal h minus 1 gk, can be rewritten as a linear system. And so we solve the linear system to get d, and then we add d to theta. And the reason for doing this is that there are very good iterative methods for computing uh, d, for solving the linear system. 
as opposed to having to compute the inverse at each iteration. And the other advantage of doing it this way is sometimes you don't need to run the iterative method to completion, especially in the beginning where you still don't know how far you are from the optimum. It might make sense to run the iterative method to get D, so you just want a rough descent direction. And as you're getting closer to the minimum, then you want to be much more accurate. And so that gives, so quite often in practice, you'll see that implementation is you first evaluate the gradient, you evaluate the Hessian. Now in code, most optimization algorithms, they require that you write a function that is the gradient. If you have a mathematical expression for the gradient, and you'll see that for neural networks and logistic regression, and, and I've already demonstrated it for linear regression, we will always have a ex mathematical expression for the gradient. Um, if we don't have mathematical expressions for the gradient or the objective, then what do we do? Differentiation. We could do that. Where is another way of doing optimization when you don't have gradients? Bayesian optimization. So we've seen that in the course how to deal with the case where we don't have a mathematical model. But for neural networks we will have a mathematical model and we will have derivatives. And if you have information about the curvature and you know, the slope of the function, then you can do much better than by doing Bayesian optimization. You can be much more aggressive. The other thing that we're doing here is we're being local. In Bayesian optimization we're asking a lot. We're asking to do exploration exploitation. So we're not being local when we optimize. We're, we're searching all over the space, trying to be global, to trying to find the optimum minimum. Here we're being very aggressive. We're just looking for a local optimum. And so in the code, most, I mean, you're not going to be implementing Newton methods very often in practice because there's very good software out there to do new, new, Newton methods. Um, if, you, um, if you're in MATLAB, then I strongly recommend you use this function, min-cut. Um, this is by Mark Schmidt. It's one of the most widely used methods for optimization machine learning using second order methods and so on. And all that code requires, um, and there's some Python implementations out there I think as well. Oh, this is very similar stuff. Marsh Schmidt was a PhD here. He went to Paris to do a postdoc. Um, now, um, and that code indeed, you know, if like the people in Stanford everywhere use this code, it, it's very good. Um, and that code just requires that you write a file that is the gradient. So you write grad, you, you write it as a function in Python, def, grad, da, da, da. and so you pass it theta and K and it returns back the gradient. And you do the same thing for the Hessian. So in the code, typically you're not going to write all the steps. The only thing you're going to write is uh, two functions for these calls. Okay, a function that will return the gradient, a function that returns that evaluates the Hessian. And then there's very good code for solving this. In MATLAB, if you search for you can search for MinDress, I think it's called that. And I think it's called that in Python as well. So this is part of NumPy. Um, there are iterative methods for solving linear systems. We teach them in 402 here at UBC. Does that do something different than solve in NumPy? Um, I don't know what solve does. NumPy experts? Solve is probably what you want to use because it probably will choose the method. Yeah, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look at the yeah, yeah. documentation. Yeah, no, that's all. It's fine. Yeah. But, um, so MinDress, you could also, uh, it all depends on the properties of this function. If the function is symmetric, you do MinDress. If the matrix is positive definite, which it is in this case, then you can use conjugate gradients as well. So conjugate gradient is uh, a method for solving linear systems that's iterative. min -res. It turns out that all these algorithms are actually from the same family, uh, a family called Krillo methods. And if you're interested by this type of numerical optimization, then next year take, take 
take four or two, a uh, fourth year course here, that's very good. If it's metric positive definite, are these methods related to LU decomposition? Um, so you could use LU decomposition, but the, the thing with LU decomposition, you're going to pay the cost of NQ. Okay. And so with these methods, you're paying N squared times number of iterations. Right. Um, some of these, like conjugate gradient, they're guaranteed to give you the same solution as um, LDU decomposition if the number of iterations is N. Mm -hmm. So if you do the same work at N cube, you get the answer. But for a lot of matrices, if the matrices um, happen to have a lot of structure, and typically machine learning, they will have that structure, mm -hmm. then the number of iterations will usually be much smaller than N. And if that's the case, then you profit from using these methods. And that's why we use them. It might be that all you need to do is 100 iterations and you're done. And then again, the same argument as I said before. In the beginning of the optimization, if you don't get the gradient perfect, and you still, so you're on top of the mountain. If you don't really find the best, steepest point, if you, as long as you're going downhill a bit, you will go down. The problem is when you get to the village down, then it starts mattering more because the slope there becomes flatter. And so which way you go matters because you could get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, okay. In practice, do we add some small diagonal terms to the Hessian matrix in, in case it's in a really linear area? Yes. So then there's a whole family of what people call the quasi-Newton methods, which are variations of methods where you could, for example, do, um, so your trick is think of something called levenberg marquardt roughly similar, where you add a diagonal term to the Hessian to make sure that it's, uh, the Hessian is easy to, um, has good properties. In fact, that you can invert it. Um, so people do that. Um, uh, in optimization, there's also these things called preconditioners, we, which can help um, uh, reshape the Hessian uh, without affecting the location of the optimum. If we had a diagonal in the linear case, that's equivalent to um, regularization then, right? To ridge regression. Yeah, it's very similar to ridge regression. So here it's kind of being done for a different purpose. Uh, optimization is a massive field. And um, I think, I don't know, how, how many of you are taking uh, Michael Friedlander's course? Uh, one. Michael Friedlander's one, two. Uh, he's one of the top optimization people in the world. And if you care about machine learning, um, that's probably one of the most important courses to take at UBC um, after this course in order to learn machine learning, because it's, it's very good. Or the randomized algorithms course, but I think Nick is not teaching one this term. Finally, Uri would love to have anybody in 542G from this course, I'm sure, and Hen as well. Oh, yeah. So Hen teaches what they call sparse matrix linear algebra, and that's where they use all these methods. Uh, so they teach methods, they, they're worried about solving linear systems, and you kind of might think, oh, God, that course must be boring if all they're doing is linear sy solving linear systems. We've done that in second year, why bother? And um, that's because um, solving this problem actually turns out to be very tricky. And if you know how to solve this problem, then you can do optimization. And you can do neural networks and all sorts of things. But this optimization is sort of a subcomponent of the bigger problem. Our optimization also has the element of randomness. A slight difference with the um, when we're doing deterministic optimization. One last thing I didn't mention is this concept of line search. So most software in practice also does line search. Um, I didn't cover it uh, here so far in the presentation, but basically line search is um, you look ahead, say one step, and from that you sort of try to estimate the curvature. You try to decide whether you're going too fast or too slow. Okay, because if you look ahead and you see that your error has gone up, that means that you probably are going too fast. And if you look ahead and your error hasn't changed, that means probably you're going too slow. And so if you look ahead one step and you try to adjust your learning rate, then essentially you get something called line search. So most codes out there also have this. 
So like I said, the numerical optimization courses worry about this and this is what you will learn when you take a numerical optimization course. For us, we will use those procedures, the generic uh, procedures for optimization, but we just need to know that we need to pass these two expressions. So we need to know how to compute derivatives and hessians. If we know how to write the expression for the derivative and hessian of any problem, then our job is done. We just now let their optimizers uh, do the job. Okay. Now, let's end with the following problem. The problem of the date is coming, but it's three. Um, and so today, I, by the way, I gave you an example of how to compute the gradient and the Hessian for a linear model. In the next class, I will tell you how to compute the gradient and the Hessian for a neuron to do binary classification. Um, and then next week, we're going to look at lots of networks, uh, lots of neural networks, and then I will tell you how to compute the gradients and the Hessians in those cases. I should also add that um, I mentioned that the Hessian for a, a problem with 100,000 parameters or 100 million parameters will be 100 million squared. Okay? And so computing the Hessian is actually expensive. Or even if filling it in is not expensive, um, storing the Hessian is expensive. Because you have to store um, 100 million terms squared. You might half it by using the fact that it's, uh, it's positive definite. But um, it's still a lot of parameters that you need to store. And that gets you in trouble when you're doing very large scale problems. Um, using second order methods are sort of preferable, but they're, you're paying in memory. Okay? And if you have a problem that is too large, your machines run out of memory when you use these methods. So I think and last year, in fact, uh, for, for th not the previous term, for 340, uh, people had to classify tweets. And those who tried to use Hessian methods ended up emailing the TA, uh, you know, wondering why the, what was wrong with the machine. And well, the problem was actually it had run out of memory. So. That's sort of the, the, there's a trade off there. The Hessian is very nice, but it's problematic to store it. Okay. Assume, let's look at the following problem. Let's assume that we want to compute a mean. Okay, the mean of just an average. So, one way to compute an average, let's, let's say that the average. is theta k. And let's say that it's the average of endpoints, xi. So you have endpoints, and you want to compute the average. You sum them, divide by n, and um, that's your theta. And each x now here is k. So that's one way to compute it. Another way to try to compute it is recursively. How do we compute the same thing recursively? Um, let's do the following derivation. We'll rewrite theta k as xn. Oh, sorry, I should say theta, theta n in this case. And then the subindex for theta just means that it's a function of n xi's. Okay. So we take xn times 1 over n plus 1 over n, the sum from i equal 1 to n minus 1 of xi. Okay, so all I did was I took the last term out of the sum. Now I'm only going up to n minus 1. And I'm going to do one more trick. I'm going to multiply and divide by n minus 1. Okay, so I haven't done anything. But that allows me to nonetheless rewrite this as 1 over n xn plus 1 over n, mi uh, n minus 1 times n 
minus 1 over n the sum from my equal 1 to n minus 1 x i okay so I've just grouped terms slightly different to make it obvious that this is equal now to 1 over n x n plus n minus 1 divided by n times theta n minus 1 okay, using our definition of the average. In other words theta n is equal to 1 minus 1 over n times theta n minus 1 plus 1 over n x n. If you are on a computer on average and your n is very large and you can't store all the x's in memory, this is how you would do it. You would just basically add one at a time and you would compute the average. Um, and of course, there are trade-offs here. Because adding one point at a time means you're looking at disk space or some other storage device and you're getting that into memory and doing the update. Now, lookups are very expensive, whether it's a disk or whether it's in a network. So you want to store as much as possible to RAM always. The problem is that there's limitations in RAM. And so what we do is we basically try to store as much as we have, but be aware that we might have to do disk lookups or network lookups. And so this is one way of computing the mean. This is the batch way. This is another way, and this is the online way. We're going to use the same idea for minimum optimizing gradients in machine learning. Um, typically in machine learning, we have an objective, and I say that objective was a function of theta, but that objective also involves some data. So that objective is a function of theta and x, and there is some distribution over the data from where it comes from. So the objective of machine learning always involves some data. And think of P of X as the model of the world that generates the data. If we have samples, hallucinations from the world, you know, realizations of the data, then this gets approximated with 1 over n, the sum from i equal 1 to n, j of theta comma x i. Okay, which is what we had before at the beginning of the lecture, where I said the cost is typically a sum of terms. The reason why it's a uh, sum of terms is because um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize this expected loss or expected risk or expected cost and this is basically the empirical cost and then cost is also known as risk Uh, in the machine learning. So a lot of people in machine learning, they call themselves empirical risk minimizers. And that's because they've sort of acknowledged the data is coming from some distribution in the world, but we only get to see a few data points. And that's why we call our, we think of machine learning as, as, as that's why it's stochastic, because um, the data is a random variable. The frequency the data is a random variable. Same for Bayesians. Bayesians on top assume that theta is a random variable. But for this discussion, all we need to realize is that in machine learning, we're optimizing a cost function over both data and theta, and then we're integrating over the data. With this in mind, um, we can also look at the gradient. 
and provided that the functions here are all sort of have some nice properties um, we can just write the gradient inside this way for most of the problems that we deal with in this course we certainly can do this um, there are you know I'm assuming linearity here of expectation but linearity of expectation only applies there are counter cases um, there are functions that can break that not the kind of functions we will encounter here or that you'll encounter working for a company most likely now uh, if you do this then um, when we update theta k when we use gradient descent we are essentially <coughs> running an algorithm of this form okay so that's just the, the expression for the gradient and sometimes if we let n be equal to 1 so you only draw one sample at a time you can write this as theta k minus eta j of theta k and then xk so you read one data point you update theta read another data point update theta every time you get a tweet that mentions Obama you update the probability that Obama will win the election if that's what you were estimating is it that was the expression for the gradient? Uh, that's correct j of theta x is the gradient sorry gradient of j of theta is the gradient so in least squares would be like uh, minus 2 x transpose y plus x transpose x theta okay Um, and here what I'm doing is I'm just marginalizing over x I'm computing the expectation over x to get rid of x um, just by standard marginalization property now the reason why I've written it this way is because here we're making a hell of an approximation we're only using one x at a time but I will argue that this is essentially the same as doing this type of thing so in particular if I choose if I choose this eta to be 1 over n it's possible to prove and that's outside this course but it's possible to prove that this algorithm will actually converge to the minimum so if you have a quadratic function it will get to the minimum so the theory tells us just choose eta to be 1 over n and it's sort of I've given you a taste of it by giving you an example um, and um, to give you a sort of more intuition is because you can write this as theta k minus eta j of theta k plus eta times j of theta k minus j of theta k comma xk And so what I did there in this line is I, I subtracted minus eta j of theta k, which is the expected gradient, and then I added it. So I added and subtracted it. And the reason why I did that is because then you can see that this here is the true gradient. that is there is no uncertainty because of the fact that I haven't seen all the data so this would be the gradient if you could compute the expectation which for most distributions in the world we will not be able to do it because we actually don't know the distribution that generated the data if you knew the distribution of the world then you would know everything but we don't know that um, but if you write it this way you can see that the 
what we're doing is we're following the true gradient and then there is a noise term. That noise term is the difference between the true gradient when we do the full expectation and the gradient that is evaluated at the data that you've observed. That difference is uh, why these methods are called stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so the stochastic here is only because we haven't seen all the data in the world. It's not because we're adding noise. The noise is implicit in the problem. It's the result of us not having seen all the data. Okay, so to finish, and actually, sorry, I went over a couple minutes. Um, there are several ways to compute the online, the, the gradient. One way is if you have n data points, you can just use the, the expression for the gradient that we've seen before. The online gradient, every time you read an x, you update theta. And then something in between is the following. That's called a mini batch, where you read 20 points, assuming the 20 points is what your memory can deal with, and then you update the gradient for 20 points. So that's equivalent as essentially using this gradient here when your n is 20. And those are the three methods to implement it. For neural networks, you will be implementing this sort of thing. And this is going to be another parameter. So you're going to have now two parameters. How do we estimate these two parameters quickly? How do we deal with estimating metaparameters? Gaussian process is Bayesian optimization. So you put a Bayesian optimization on top of this method and 